Let us come and sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if only you would hear his voice. Do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did that day at Massah in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested me and tried me, though they had seen what I had done. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. So I declared an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. It's always a dangerous thing to talk about worship because worship is such a deeply personal thing. But this morning I want to talk about exactly what happens when we worship. And to start, I want to start in a pretty unusual and unexpected place. For my birthday about two years ago, Cindy took me to a concert at the Hollywood Bowl of Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. <laughs> that night turned out to be Tom Petty's last performance before he died the week after that concert. And I remember thinking about one of his songs where he talks about why some people love his music. And one of the lyrics of one of his songs has this line that says, some people love his kind of music the same way other people love Jesus, because it does the same thing to their souls. And that lyric has always struck me, that the songwriter views an experience with Jesus as just kind of another religious or spiritual experience, set aside a bunch of equally valid spiritual experiences. You know, the assumption of that lyric is that Christian spirituality is a purely internal experience. When I was in college, we studied the classic book, Varieties of Religious Experience, by the Harvard philosopher William James. And the essence of the thesis of William James's book is that all religious experiences and spiritual experiences can be explained psychologically as something that's happening purely inside the psychology of the person having the experience. And I kind of doubt whether Tom Petty ever read William James, although it's possible, but that's kind of the philosophy that underlies that lyric. And I think a lot of people view Christian worship that same way. That, That when Christians worship God like we're doing here today, They have an internal experience inside of their own minds and hearts. And that's it. And so according to this approach, our experience of worship, our singing, the the instruments and the songs, the physical space that we worship in, practices like prayer and the sacraments, the preaching of the Word and the reading of the Word of God, they trigger something that's already inside of us and cause that internal thing inside of us to come out. In fact, a couple of years ago, 2012, two sociologists at the University of Washington did a study of what happens in people's brains while they attend a worship service. I wonder what it was like in that service that they attended, having electrodes or something. And the focus of their study was on worship services at very large churches. And these two sociologists found 
that the lighting and the crowds and the music and the preaching all stimulated a part of the brain that certain drugs stimulate to create a sense of well-being and euphoria. And that the larger the church, the more that part of the brain was stimulated. Which is one reason why the authors say megachurches have become so popular in American culture. And they noted that anyone can follow the methods, whether they know God or, or not, to use the right lighting and the right kind of music and the right kinds of stories to stimulate that part of the brain. So many people view our worship experience as a purely internal thing. But what if it's not? What if worship is more than what happens inside of us? What if we actually encounter a reality outside of ourselves when we worship God together as we've done today? See, that's what I believe happens when we worship, during authentic Christian worship. That we encounter the God who is outside of us, the God who made us, the God who knows us, the God who loves us, the God who saves us, the God who has promised to fulfill his plans and purposes in us and through us and in the world. That it's not merely something happening inside of me and inside of you, but that there's a reality outside of ourselves that we encounter when we worship. And that's what I think this psalm is telling us, Psalm 95. You know, if you're unfamiliar with the psalms, the psalms is a collection of 150 song lyrics found in the Old Testament part of the Bible that were used by the ancient Hebrews and used by Christians throughout 2,000 years to inform their experience of worship. Psalm 95 is what's historically called an invitatory psalm because it invites us or it calls us into worship. And because of this uniqueness, it, this particular psalm is one of the most quoted psalms by Christians all over the world throughout the ages. In fact, for those church traditions that practice morning prayer, like in the Anglican church, in the Lutheran church, and, and sometimes in the Reformed tradition... Morning prayer is always opened with Psalm 95. When Christian monks and nuns in Benedictine monasteries gather for lauds, morning prayer, they sing this psalm to God each morning. And Psalm 95, I think, shows us at least three things that are happening with God when we encounter Him in worship. We began our worship time today by listening to Jill read the words, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. The open invitation of this invitatory psalm is for us to make joyful music to God with, with our voices and with music and with instruments, which is what we've done this morning. You'll often hear me say that the Bible never prescribes a particular style or kind of music to do this. It could be an all-boys choir in a cathedral during even song, or it could be a choir anthem at a historic downtown church. It could be the opening movement of a symphony orchestra, or it could be the quiet strumming of an acoustic guitar during a Taze service in France. It could be the booming subs and loud electric guitar in a stadium worship service or the soft chanting in a monastery. Everyone has their own musical likes and preferences, but the Bible says whatever they are, sing a joyful song to the Lord. To use any and every kind of music at our disposal to bring attention and glory to God. And, and then verse 1 calls God the rock of our salvation. The Bible often uses this image of a rock to describe God's reliability, His constancy. The fact that God is a safe and secure place for us to find refuge when our personal lives or our, our world or our community is filled with chaos and disorder and change. And these first verses focus on creation, the, the height and depth of creation, the breadth of creation across all the earth, the depths of the earth to the highest mountain peaks. 
And for ancient Israel, the highest mountain they were familiar with would have been Mount Hermon, which which stands at about 9,000 feet above sea level. But of course, there are are other mountains in the world, actually more than 100 mountain peaks in the world that are over 23,000 feet above sea level, the highest being Mount Everest. And these, these peaks, these high points testify to the greatness of God. And for breadth, the psalmist talks about the oceans and the dry land, the oceans that cover 70% of the earth, the, the, the dry land of different habitats like wetlands to deserts from forests to grasslands to rainforests to tundra, the, the, the height and the breadth and the depth of God's creation testify to God's greatness. Worship expands our vision of God's greatness. When we encounter God in worship, it expands our vision of God's greatness. And this isn't just something that happens inside of us. It happens when we actually encounter the living God. I chose this picture of Cathedral Peak in Yosemite because in many ways the natural world around us is a cathedral, a sanctuary of God's greatness. The mountains and the oceans, the deserts and the rainforests, the wonders of our world all bear witness to the greatness of God. And many people go outside because they're inspired by this. Maybe you've seen the bumper sticker, nature is my church. But I want you to notice that Psalm 95 is not urging us to run outside to the mountains or the beach to expand our vision of God's greatness. Psalm 95 is inviting us inside the sanctuary with the rest of God's people to encounter God's greatness. In Psalm 95, the people, they're not going outside on a hike to Half Dome in Yosemite. They're coming inside with the rest of God's people to worship. You see, the natural world around us bears witness to God's greatness, but it's our worship together that interprets that witness for us. It gives us words. And it's not to say that we don't experience God in nature, we do, but it's to say that there's something unique about gathering together in the sanctuary with the people of God to worship that opens us to encountering the greatness of God in unique and profound ways. A lot of you know that I grew up here in Southern California. In fact, I've lived my entire life in a 50-mile radius. I don't get around much, apparently. And from sixth grade to my freshman year in high school, I lived in Sunland, Tahunga in, in L.A. County. And we had a house that backed up to Latuna Canyon. There were no other houses behind our house. And so as a kid, I would spend hours hiking the trails of Latuna Canyon. And when I was about 10 years old, I was hiking the trails of Latuna Canyon, and I heard someone yelling. And I looked up and I could see a man on the side of Verdugo Crestline Drive, about a hundred yards from where I was hiking. And he thought he was alone. He didn't see me. And he was yelling. And as as I drew closer, I realized that he was yelling to God. He was yelling, why God? Where are you, God? He was yelling out his prayers. He sounded desperate and troubled as he, as he looked down on this beautiful canyon yelling his prayers out to God. And even at 10 years old, I realized that I had stumbled upon a very holy, very private moment. To this day, I don't know what his circumstances were or what painful journey he was going through, but nature was bearing witness to God. And as it did, he was desperately calling out to God's presence in his life, but he wasn't surrounded with other people worshiping to give him language to help him interpret the greatness of God. You see, our experience of worship takes that that sense of awe, that sense of enchantment that we experience in the world around us and gives us words. It interprets us for us to give us a vision, expand our vision of the greatness of God. In verse 6 of Psalm 95, the psalmist shifts from this jubilant song that's fueled by God's greatness in creation to more quiet reflection. Reflection. 
Let us bow down, kneel and worship. If the first movement of this psalm was like a, a telescope, the second movement of the song is like a microscope zeroing into our lives. Here the psalmist reminds us that God is not just the great God, that God is our God. These verses picture God as our shepherd, as a good shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep who are safe to look and search for the one sheep who's run astray. A shepherd who stares down predators and puts himself in harm's way to protect the sheep of his pasture. For God's people, we are this shepherd's people, the flock under his tender care. During the summer, I've been reading this book by a guy named Andy Root called uh, Being a Pastor in the Secular Age. And the author drives deep into contemporary philosophy about postmodernism and secularism and, and traces how people can live, how pastors can be faithful to their calling in, in our secular culture. And one of the things he talks about is that the Greeks and the Romans viewed all of their gods primarily as kings, as monarchs. But the ancient Hebrews and then later the Christians viewed God primarily as a shepherd God. God himself is a pastor. God himself lovingly leads and protects and shepherds his people. And the essence of a shepherd is to, to guide a group of sheep from one place to another with loving care, generosity, and goodness. The shepherd leads the sheep to safety and security and provision, provision because the shepherd loves the sheep. And Root says this should be a model for every pastor that seeks to be a shepherd to a congregation. You see, worship not only expands our vision of God's greatness, it draws us closer to God's love. It draws us closer to the shepherd's loving care. And again, if the first movement of the psalm is like a telescope drawing attention to God's greatness in all of creation, this second movement is like a microscope helping us see where God's love is in the details of our lives. In fact, in verse 7, the Hebrew word translated care in the translation that we read this morning is actually the Hebrew word for hand, hand. Just as the shepherd guides the sheep with their own hand, God guides us and cares for us with his loving hand. God's gracious hand is on our lives. His gentle, compassionate, yet firm hand guiding us. Our experience of worshiping God together each week helps us see and discern where God's hidden yet loving hand is present and showing up in our lives. It's as if each week the, the busyness of life distracts us from His hand. And so we, we come together to worship each week and through sacrament and music and through prayer and through the preaching and reading of the Word of God, we once again are drawn close to His heart and see His hand. Situations where we thought God was absent, we can suddenly see evidence of His loving hand. Decisions that we made during the week that we thought were right at the time, we begin to be convicted and realize that they, they were from our own selfishness and God's loving hand leads us to repentance and a decision to do things differently next time. We worship together. And as we do, the experience of worship draws us close to God's love. The second half of verse 7 through the end of the psalm feels very abrupt. I mean, the first six and a half verses of the psalm are deeply poetic, an invitation to, to encounter and have a vision of God's greatness, to draw close to God's love, and then suddenly, but today if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart as your ancestors did. And this transition seems very abrupt. In fact, a lot of people stop in the middle of verse 7 because they don't like the rest of the psalm. 
But this transition makes sense if you really think about it. If worship is more than an internal experience, if we really are encountering the living God, we shouldn't be surprised when God speaks to us while we worship Him. And when God speaks, we have to decide whether or not we'll listen to His voice. The psalmist reminds us of what happened to God's people in the past. After God delivered the people of Israel from their slavery in Egypt, they found themselves in a desert called Rephidim. You can, you can read about it in Exodus chapter 17. And as they were there in the heat of the desert of Rephidim, the people grew thirsty and they demanded that Moses provide them with water to quench their thirst. And Moses urged them to trust God to quench their thirst. He had brought them this far out of their slavery. He was worthy of being trusted again, but the people's grumbling grew and grew until they were ready to kill Moses. Rather than listen to and trust the voice of God in the desert of Rephidim, they put God to the test. God provided them with water, but he also disciplined them. And Moses renamed the desert of Rephidim Meribah, which means testing or proving, because they demanded that God prove himself to them again and again. And the same thing happened in the book of Numbers at a place called Massah. Once again, the people were thirsty. They rebelled against God. They rebelled against Moses and his brother Aaron, and they wanted to turn back and head back to Egypt, back to their slavery. And Massah means strife or quarreling because the people quarreled with God. And throughout history, the people of God have remembered Meribah and Massah as examples and places where God spoke to His people, but they didn't listen to His voice. Even though God had miraculously delivered them from their slavery, they kept putting Him to the test again and again, making, demanding God prove Himself. And this psalm tells us that their hearts had gone astray. Rather than their hearts being inclined towards God, their hearts were inclined away from God to distrust God's goodness. So even though they've been delivered by God's power, saved from Egypt, they'd not yet learned to walk in God's ways. And because of that, they weren't yet ready to enter into the land of promise that God was bringing them into. And they wandered for 40 days. These verses remind me of that great 18th century hymn that we sing sometimes, Come Thou Thought of Every Blessing. And in the third verse of that hymn, the songwriter talks about how our hearts are prone to wander away from God, even though we love God. Just like Israel, our hearts are inclined away from God to distrust God, to distrust His voice. And the hymn writer asks God in the song that in His goodness would you bind my wandering heart to you so I don't wander away. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. You see, worship invites us to respond to God's voice. It's an invitation to respond. If worship were merely a personal, internal experience, no response would be required. It would just be our weekly catharsis, a weekly attitude adjustment. But if worship is truly an encounter with the living God, we might actually hear God speak and then have to decide whether we respond. And God speaks in many different ways in worship he speaks through the music. He speaks through our prayer times together. He speaks through the sacraments of the Lord's Supper and baptism. He speaks through His Word when it's read and when it's taught. God is speaking right now. God is speaking today to all who will listen. And so if you hear His voice, open your hearts. Worship expands our vision of God's greatness, draws us close to His loving hand, 
and invites us to respond to his voice. It's more than something happening inside of us. It's not just an experience, it's an encounter. An encounter with the living God. The God who knows you more than you know yourself. The God who made you, who loves you, who saves you, who corrects you and convicts you, and who is working out His plan and purpose in our lives and in our world. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for this call to worship. And Lord, it begins so jubilant and upbeat But it ends so serious with a call to listen. So, Lord, we say today as we prepare our hearts to receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, speak, Lord, your servants, your children, your people are listening. We soften our hearts. We open our hearts. We want to learn your ways. Speak to us. Amen.